Today I'm going to talk to you about the medieval ship. I'm going to run through the last 16 years in the next 45 minutes. And I've got the coveted free lunch spot. So I will definitely finish on time. And if there aren't time for questions, you can ask myself or any of the members of the Friends of the Ship, uh, the volunteers, or Nigel Mailing. Uh, we can answer your questions. Um, it's actually quite special giving talks about the ship in this building because this is exactly where it was found, just uh, about 20 meters that way. So what I thought I'd do today, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the ship, let's just discuss a bit about the background. Can you still see me if I can you? Perfect. Okay. I uh, thought we'd discuss some of the background to the uh, discovery of the ship, uh, and then go through the excavation, and then all the decade plus of post-ex work we've, we've done, and talk about what we've learned uh, from you know, the small finds and the uh, environmental evidence, and then we'll go into our modeling, uh, hull reconstruction, and then bring you right up to speed with where we're at today in terms of conservation and uh, our efforts towards uh, eventual reassembly and display of the ship, as well as publication and archiving. So I'm going to attempt to do all of that, and, uh, as you'll see. So just a, a few basic facts uh, first, uh, just some bit of context. Uh, as Phil said, it was found 16 years ago uh, in the summer of 2002 during the construction works for this very building. And uh, we know that it uh, approximate dates, uh, it's uh, uh, planking from the hull has been dated to after 1449. And this is from the Basque Country, uh, uh, corner of the Bay of Biscay. Uh, I'll show you a map. And we know that uh, there's other material of a more local origin being added to the ship in the late 1460s, or after 1465. It's a quinker built merchant vessel. It's extremely large, as you'll come to appreciate. Uh, incredibly well preserved by the Anoxic River sediments, and you can see when they first found it, archaeologists actually walking back and forth on the uh, original timbers of the ship. And, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about why it was so well preserved. Uh, and interestingly, the ship appears to be Basque uh, in origin. However, all of the environmental evidence, uh, ceramics, coins, almost anything like that found on board appears to be, uh, or is, uh, Portuguese. And uh, points uh, Lisbon South, and uh, we know that it came into Newport uh, in the late 1460s. Again, these, this is based on the uh, dendrochronological dendro research, and if you want a lot of details about it, Nigel's here, and you can field those. And so uh, that generally brackets its use life, uh, its existence really from around middle of the 15th century into the uh, by the late 1460s. And we don't have the entire ship; it was partially salvaged in antiquity. And we still have a substantial amount though, you know, it was the site, what the assemblage we now have consists of thousands of timbers as about, and about a thousand artifacts. Uh, just a bit of uh, geographical context, we're obviously here uh, up the Severn Estuary, up the River Esk. Uh, the timbers for the hull, the planking vessel, appear to be from this area, and the trade goods uh, appear to be from down here. So. We believe the ship as a merchant vessel was engaged in uh, trade uh, across here and up into the Seven Estuary, most likely trading with Bristol. Uh, this is a uh, contemporary, uh, just a maybe 10 year old uh, uh, drawing of uh, what Newport uh, might have looked like in the medieval period. And it was, uh, you can see the ship uh, uh, in the side channel here in the hill. Now, what we think happened was in the late 1460s, the ship was brought up the River Rusk on a very high tide and de uh, deballasted it and brought into a side channel here. Uh, before that happened, actually, it looks like they pre erected a sort of crude cradle structure and brought the ship in onto that cradle structure. And we've done some modeling that shows that really was only possible on the highest of tides. And it looks like the ship was brought in and then on this cradle and then propped up and therefore, you know, stable. And it looks like they were in the process of refitting the ship. And we know this because there's timbers, such as riders and some knees, being, they look like they're fitted into the ship and they're shaped and maybe tacked into place, but they're not actually bolted. They're not actually fastened fully into the ship. And so it looks like it's undergoing this refitting process. And also this is supported by the dendrochronological research where you have uh, timber that's not 
uh, part of the original build of the ship. It has this, these later 1460s dates. It looks like the ship's undergoing this refit, and during this refitting process, however, for one reason or another, this the ship heels over onto its starboard side, and uh, it looks like uh, it, that could have been for a variety of reasons, but. Um, the long and short of it is the ship heeled over. We have a huge tidal rage on the river here, and within a matter of hours, a huge amount of you know silt-filled water would be flooding into the vessel that's over on its side. Well, that wasn't the end of it. They there seems to be evidence on board that they that wasn't they didn't give up yet. They attempted to actually right the ship, and they put drain holes in it. There were um, evidence of uh, pumps on board. Uh, whether that's U-slide or post deposition, we're not exactly sure. It could have been both, but uh, it looks like they were at least attempting to try to right the vessel and save it, because it was still in you know, great shape, it just happened to be flooded. Uh, however, uh, you're fighting 12 hours, you're every 12 hours you're having a huge tide coming in, and they eventually gave up on this uh, effort to try to save the ship, and they set about salvaging what they could still reach. And so what happened, they basically set about it with axes and uh, whatnot, and just salvaged uh, most of the upper works, including uh, you know things like the we don't have the masts. Uh, uh, there's no anchors or guns. And it's interesting of all the artifacts we find. Uh, you know, there's hundreds, maybe a thousand artifacts. Uh, there's not a single artifact you couldn't lift with one hand. I mean, the ship had big artifacts on board, but all of that was stripped out. There was time to salvage all that, and it's it's just logical that would have been readily reusable on other vessels. So anyway, what we have here is not a true shipwreck. It's a ship that's you know, come to grief in the middle of a medieval town, and it's been, you know, is more or less empty when it was brought in, and we still find lots of artifacts, but they're all very small. Uh, and this is an idea of uh, what the ship might have looked like in the late 1460s being brought into the side channel or pill in Newport. And then, uh, then this event happened, and it got very quickly sealed in the mud, and then partially salvaged. And then, Fast forward to 2002 during the building works for this building, and it gets rediscovered. A uh, bit about uh, the site here: it's a it was a rescue excavation, uh, and uh, some of you were here for the excavation. Actually, you uh, this is a a coffer dam was put in, a sheep pal coffer dam was put in. So they had no idea the ship was there to start with. They you know working on this working on this site. The uh, sheep pal coffer dam is inserted and excavation uh, begins, and it was actually this one area they decided they needed to dig quite deeply, and it was the, in the other theater, it was the orchestra pit in front of the main stage, and they needed to remove a lot of that material and do, to do it safely, they put in the sheep pile coffer dam in order to clear the material out so they could put in, um, you know, the foundations and the forms for the walls and floors. Anyway, uh, punching that coffer dam in, uh, as you'll come to see, the ship was found in the bottom of it, uh, running from the stern is here and the bow is there, uh, diagonally across this coffer dam. And uh, you'll see a little bit of the bow was clipped off, but they were able to go back in April of 2003 and recover about a, about 125 timbers from that uh, section. Uh, just a bit of historical context as well. Uh, the River Rust has been, uh, you know, major trading. Uh, Newport has been a major trading area. And in the late 18th and into the, especially 19th centuries, the, the entire river was just covered with these wharves. And you can still see remnants of them, actually, when you're walking uh, just this morning on the other side, you can still see remnants of some of the wharves uh, up here. A lot has been removed, but the further down river you go, they're still there, and they're in amazing condition, but they're more or less inaccessible and off limits because it's mostly on the docks land. But Newport, all, it used to be these uh, just endless wharves, and it was because there was a canal that ran down here parallel to the river, and you had the ships coming up, uh, and then goods going into the wharfs, and uh, goods from the valleys and whatnot coming down and uh, into the wharfs and onto the ships and out there. So it was a very active trading area, and it was actually you know very active in the medieval period. For perhaps not as trade though. It, it's quite possible that uh, it seems that Bristol was the main trade port during this period. And if you actually if you go out the front of this building or the side of up here, upriver corner, you can actually still see this corner today. And if you look back towards the city this way, this is the town, what's left of the town pill, which actually extended up through the town. But it was another one of these pills underneath Monterey Wharf here where the ship was found and where this building now sits. I think you can see here, you can see that corner right there is the corner that's 
still preserved out here, and then you have the town hill, but it's all been obviously you know covered over. But you can just see, and obviously the castle is still there today, and the town bridge is in more or less the same spot. So uh, early on in the excavation, uh, again, there's nobody has any idea of their ship here. They start hitting different levels of archaeology. Uh, one of the levels was this wood line drain. Uh, then they decided to uh, put a test trench in, a test pit, uh, rather, and uh, excavated more, and then found a stone key. And I'm glossing over, there's many other things that were found uh, in this site and in this area. Uh, but then eventually, so we're walking down through you know, multiple meters of uh, alluvial uh, sediment. And then this is the first part of the ship to appear, a few planks and a, a part of a frame. And then they continue to excavate. Well, they continue to excavate to the around, and it just keeps growing and growing until it more or less fills this copper dam corner to corner. I think I've got some plant view slides, which will give you a better idea of that. And so uh, excavation work uh, began, and we, well, I don't have time to go into the politics, and uh, I, I'll just say that the ship was really saved because of um, public protests and you know the friends of the ship or the Save Our Ship campaign, and uh, just a lot of coverage, media coverage, and just a lot of awareness was raised, and that uh, really helped um, ensure that the ship wasn't just studied in the ground, but was actually um, saved, it was actually recovered and uh, saved for further study. Uh, this is. Uh, but Simon Hickman will talk more about that tomorrow in his presentation, which is about the uh, 21st century kind of history of the, um, the Friends of the Ship campaign and the, the <coughs> campaign to actually uh, recover the vessel, kind of the social side of it. I'm sticking to the archaeology today. So uh, this is the vessel uh, largely uncovered. And actually, in this shot, you can see we're looking towards um, the bow. Uh, start here. This is the center line. It's uh, about. 35 straights, of, up to 35 straights of planking survival on the starboard side here, uh, 17 on the port side, uh, 63 um, frame stations. Uh, there's actually no real photo that you can actually see the entire ship at once, and so you have to kind of uh, view it in parts and pieces, but you'll get the idea. Uh, actually, in this photo, some of the materials have already been removed, uh, specifically the ceiling planks and the bilge boards. And what was interesting, when they were salvaging the ship, they didn't do a terribly neat and efficient job of, of sl sloppy, really. As they're cutting away the upper works and pulling great pieces of the ship out, uh, lots of pieces are falling down into this muddy water, and they're not bothering with it. So there were hundreds and hundreds of timbers found, disarticulated timbers found loose within the hold. But a lot of them, a lot of them, things like hatch covers and uh, beams and knees, a lot of these appeared to be part of the ship. And so uh, they were carefully plotted out and then kept for future study, and we've actually been able to use them in our reconstruction work. And so it's, it seems some of them are absolutely unmistakably part of the uh, ship. So anyway, these had to be cleared out first uh, during this process. You have uh, artifacts and small finds coming up left, right, and center. And so after this is cleared out, uh, there's you know, documentation of the articulated hull, and then this decision is made to actually uh, keep the, uh, retain the vessel and for, you know, disassemble it and raise it. And so uh, just in broad terms, say it took a Six months start to finish from discovery through the last timbers out of the ground in Christmas, apart from the bit in the bow. So uh, during that six months, from the summer of 2002 up through uh, winter of 2002, uh, you had kind of two phases. One is uncovering uh, the vessel and excavating down uh, to this level, and then re you're removing all the disarticulated material. And then the second phase, where you're actually disassembling the ship and raising it. But all that took place within six months. 2002. Uh, some of the last pieces, and it was a, a extremely difficult to get the ship apart. It was so well preserved. You know, it, it, uh, it held together with wrought iron French nails, which were largely corroded along the lap straight planking. But the, the tree nails holding the frame to the planking were incredibly well preserved, just as well preserved as the rest of the ship. Uh, I should have said that almost uh, all of the structural parts of the ship are oak, and uh, phenomenal preservation. As those of you who were at the ship center yesterday would have seen some of the timbers and. You know, you were, I think you were rightly impressed by the uh, condition of these uh, floor timbers and planking. So uh, in um, late in 2002, last pieces up uh, here were the keel. That's when they, after underneath the keel, parts of the um, cradle structure or, or presumed cradle structure or struts. Uh, those were lifted and uh, 
provided some dendro dates as well. Uh, it's a bit hard to see, but that's uh, archaeologists in the outside the copper dam working in the bow area, pulling up um, uh, those timbers that have been severed off the bow by this installation of the sheet metal copper dam. And those were raised. And then uh, underneath uh, all of it, uh, they found a skeleton. And, uh, but it's interesting, the skeleton actually has nothing to do with the ship. It uh, dates to uh, 180 BC radiocarbon. And it uh, just shows that this pill or this channel where the ship was brought was still in, um, well, well, wasn't existed at least as far back as uh, the Iron Age, and probably much further. It, you know, it's a complicated site. It's <laughs> stratigraphically speaking, it's uh, quite challenging. Uh, this is what life was like on site, um, <laughs> at least in the summer. And then I think it was quite cold and miserable in the winters. But they did an excellent job in adverse conditions. And, and uh, the pressure they were under to excavate this enormous uh, find, you know, quite complicated as well, you know, stratigraphically. This is a, a really good plan view of the vessel. Everything in gray of the site, everything in gray or shades of gray is articulated, all remains. And you can see the scale here. And everything in color are disarticulated. But you can clearly see things like the hatch covers and the uh, B and E complex and things like carlings. It's, uh, parts of casts and all that. It was just, it was quite uh, uh, a huge amount of loose material inside the vessel, as well as I said, small finds. I mentioned the public uh, support for the project from, from early on. There were marches, protests, petitions, uh, Save Our Ship campaign. It really can't be uh, stated how important this was for ensuring the survival of this unique archaeological find. Uh, the site was open for a total, you know, it's a closed construction area, but due to, you know, public demand, they opened the site for a total of, I believe it was uh, 17 hours, spread out over three days in August and September of 2002, so 17 hours in total, and apparently they had 22,000 people queue up uh, or see the ship in the ground. You can see the queue stretching back, and this is um, right outside. You can go, you can, this sea walls or river walls here. You just see that just really gripped the uh, public protest. And there's lots of, you're really interesting, there's lots of uh, videos and uh, like I think of Time Watch and Cotton Storm and all that, and you can see some actual video footage of these early days of the excavation. So, uh, everyone you know, caught their breath after this you know, crazy Matic rescue excavation in 2002 into early 2003. And uh, ship timbers and the artifacts uh, had a variety of homes up until, uh, some in the middle of, uh, I guess it was late 03, they, they secured a, a large warehouse on the other side of Newport by the docks, uh, 50 by 50 meter uh, industrial unit. And all the ship was brought there, all the um, artifacts were brought there, and they had uh, 17 of these 5 by 10 meter tanks, and the ship was laid out. And that's when we started a, the post-excavation phase of this project. You know, standard, you know, you know this with traditional ship projects, it's usually two stages of recording. You know, you have your field work and then you have this detailed post-excavation analysis of the timbers and the artifacts, because there's so much more to learn, as you can see. This is what happened in 04. A team of four of us uh, started you know, this pilot study about a year, and we were just trying to do, figure out what, to, what work methods and what approach we should take in order to efficiently process this huge assemblage. Basically, we needed to set up a factory line to uh, clean and record these timbers and get them ready for conservation. But it wasn't just a 100 or 200 piece shipwreck, which is more normal. These were thousands of pieces, as you'll see. We, um, so we started the cleaning and uh, recording, you know, just practicing, tr really, or just, you know, learning as we went. And we then, um, uh, let's see, we, we started with four of us, and we got Heritage Lottery funding and other, other grant funding, and we team eventually became 15 people plus a huge amount of volunteers. And we spent about a, when I last checked in 2012, which was eight years into the post-ex, and we had just the post-ex phase, we'd done over 100,000 hours in this warehouse, just the paid staff, not to mention all the volunteers. And so the way it would work, we'd have, um, you know, we had uh, three of these five meter long wash tables, we had four of these recording stations, and we had 15 staff, archaeologists and conservators, and then we had um, you know, tons of volunteers and students helping. And so you'd have one or two you know, conservators, archaeologists cleaning timbers, and then you'd have two or three volunteers around them. Anyway, it was a 
very busy, uh, lively place, and we couldn't all eat lunch at the same time because there wasn't enough room upstairs. <laughs> and so it was just a really buzzing, big project, and for the next few years, we systematically worked our way through the timbers and uh, cleaning and recording and doing the wood science. Now, I had to throw these in because there's a uh, couple of uh, ship staff here, and uh, these are literally the first few days of the project, uh, taking the first planks out and cleaning them. And uh, we had um, just a huge amount of community support, and also we, we had open days uh, all the time. You know, every uh, month or so, we'd have these massive you know, open days. And I remember, I mean, I can't believe some of the numbers, but I think 500 people was typical, and sometimes they would say there was 1,500 people would show up but there'd be queues out the door because the, this is just, you know, post-excavation phase in this warehouse and people were fascinated by it and people would just come and queue up and we just, we ran at least 30 of these open days in the first, uh, in this one site when we had this uh, warehouse here. So the public were engaged from the start and they continued to be engaged through this seemingly, you know, there was no ship, it's just pieces of ship and lots of artifacts, but they were fascinated by the work that was going on. And that actually has still continued today, as you'll see if you've gone to the ship center. Uh, I think we'll see that at the very end. So, uh, how do we clean? Uh, standard, you know, dental tools and water, little hammers and chisels, and when no one's looking, big hammers. <laughs> used, uh, it just took, I can't even tell you how many tens of thousands of hours this took. And, but it was so important that the timbers are very carefully cleaned. And as during this cleaning process, uh, also many samples were taken of things like the animal fiber and the tar. And this was also uh, uh, for later analysis, but it was amazing. The timbers didn't look like much when you first looked at them. I mean, they were covered with mud, concretions, barnacles, tar, animal fiber, you name it. But if you carefully removed all that, the, what was the surface detail was phenomenal. That's what you started with, and this is what you got to. And we could see inscribed lines <coughs> uh, on the inboard and the outboard face of the planks, even on the outboard face these lines were appearing. We have over 1,200 examples of these marks, and there's all sorts of different varieties, and we still don't know what they mean, but we've cataloged them, we've documented them, and they're very important. They tell us a lot about construction sequence and about what they're thinking as they're building the ship. But we, we haven't cracked it fully, but it's, uh, it's amazing that these marks are preserved. And uh, it's this level of, of preservation as well. You know when they, it's a lap straight built ship, it's held together with wrought iron clench nails, and, round-headed nail over a square row. Those impressions are perfectly visible everywhere. And the same with, you can see the, the, the diameter of the, or the shank size and where it's positioned. And in this case, you can see that the inscribed line existed before the, the nail was inserted. I mean, that's what really, those kind of details are what are important to us for understanding the construction sequence. But look at this preservation. Obviously, the nail heads there. The nails, almost 99.9% .9 of them corroded to nothing, uh, just wrought iron. Um, you know, concretions formed, but there was no metallic iron left. But if you look really closely, can you see the star? That's the maker's mark um, on the underside of the nail head uh, star pattern that has transferred over into the timber, although that nail dissolved long ago. Uh, we didn't believe it at first, but I mean, there must have been at least a dozen of those uh, examples, and then we started believing it. It's that level of preservation on these timbers, which makes it such a fantastic uh, wreck to work on. Again, uh, tool marks. Uh, phenomenal preservation of tool marks. And these are the original edges, not just the original surfaces, but the original edges, they're sharp on this. And so it's not your typical, uh, you know, waterlogged wood. It can be like wet cardboard when, and collapse when you look at it. It is, uh, by and large, phenomenally well preserved. Uh, we chose a uh, fairly innovative uh, way to document the timbers uh, using contact digitizers uh, early on. We learned uh, that they've been doing it up in Roskilde. We went there, we uh, gave them some uh, preliminary training. We brought the, technology, the templates back with us. Uh, using Rhinoceros software, we acquired a barrel arm, and then with the HLF money we got, we <coughs> bought three more. And so we, it, it, anyone not know how the barrel arm works? Or it's just a, it's a contact digitizer. You take points with it, uh, the probe tip here. You, you basically draw lightly on the surface of the timber, things like wood grain, fasteners, uh, edges. And as you move this uh, articulated arm, it tracks that tip in X, Y, Z, you know, in three-dimensional space, and it plot the points you're taking. It plots in CAD software, and it creates a 3D wireframe drawing of what of what you're drawing, and in three dimensions and with sub-millimeter accuracy. So we chose this method. Uh, it had some major advantages, and uh, we 
drew three D wireframe drawings of every single timber, and with all the different like the nails are on a different layer, different colors. So it creates a very, um, a very powerful file, uh, very detailed. So we had four of these fire alarms, and we trained up a big team of us to do this work. And we basically had a big factory. They had a bunch of people cleaning timbers, and as fast as they could clean them, we would take them out and record them. And then we had, uh, you know, Denver chronology occurring. We, we I think it was three hundred samples. We there were 300 samples taken of, uh, for dendro, so lots of planks became three planks, um, which is why the database numbers have just swelled over the, <laughs> over the years from the initial, I think it was 1,760 timbers found in the ground. There's now 3,000 something in the database because you know, things either fall off, break, or get sawn into smaller bits. But uh, anyway, the, uh, we basically had set it up like a big factory. And the beauty of doing this three-dimensional digital recording, and measure, remember this is early days for 3D printing, but we partnered up with Cardiff University, the um, Manufacturing Engineering Center. We would make our, turn our 3D wireframe drawings, digital drawings, into solid models with the fastener holes, the bevels, the scarf joints, everything. We email, scale them down one to 10, email them to Cardiff University, and uh, they would, uh, Three, uh, laser sintering, a 3D additive manufacturing process, and they would post back a box of ship parts for us every few weeks, every month or two. As soon as we had a batch, we, you know, 100 at a time or 150 at a time, then they post them back, and we built this 1 to 10 scale 3D model of the ship uh, using 3D um, uh, additive manufacturing laser sintering. It's incredibly accurate, and, uh, you know, the, the 10 millimeter holes, nail holes, on that full scale, they are one millimeter on this model, and 35 levels of plank, 35 strakes of planking up, they still line up one millimeter to one millimeter. And so, we're really happy and pleased with how this model came out. But it was really just a starting point for us. We used it as a basis, a foundation, really, for ghosting in the missing areas. And uh, both, and, and now we start to bounce back and forth between the digital and the physical worlds. We had this great physical model produced, you know, 3D model produced by a digital methods. We then um, uh, manually uh, goes into the missing areas and then we, we would scan or take measurements of this shape and port it back into the digital world and so we and we went back and forth back and forth there are just certain things that were a lot easier to understand three-dimensionally when you had it physically in front of you than it was when it was a computer model like this but basically we worked back and forth and the, the digital and physical models were uh, worked you know cooperatively and we 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 still do this to this day, uh, physical and digital work. But uh, what it's allowed us to do is create some fairly, I'd say, very convincing uh, models, 3D models, both physical and digital, of the original hull form. And it's also because it's digital data, it allows you to do uh, really sophisticated analysis of things like seat keeping, cargo capacity, uh, saving characteristics, load and stability and all that. And so uh, that work is, is continuing now. But we have these really brilliant 3D assets, and it all dates back to the fact that we have 3D raw data of the individual ship timbers. And so that's um, what you'll see here. And uh, uh, some of you know Pat Tanner. He's been instrumental in uh, doing all this uh, advanced digital modeling for us. And you get, uh, for really ship nerds, you get some interesting um, you know, figures here for you know, things like tonnage, uh, you know, with displacement, and its saline characteristics. And so, a lot of this is, is it is published uh, in this uh, in some articles, and also uh, you know there's just see me if you need links to any of this. Uh, as I mentioned, Nigel uh, was involved in all the dendrochronology and wood science, and there is so much. Uh, these timbers hold they hold so much information, not just on a construction level, but also you know because of uh, uh, what dendrochronology, and uh, so it. Uh, it See Nigel if you want to know uh, really more, if you have any serious questions about this. But uh, uh, ship didn't date. Uh, there were dates above and below the vessel early on in the excavation, uh, late 1460s, mid 1460s, and it wasn't until there were some artifacts found in this coin I'll talk about that uh, predictionally gave a date of uh, uh, after 1447, but uh, it really was until, I want to say about 2010 or so, that the dendro really you know, matched up, and uh, we got these dates of after 1449 and uh, Providence as well. Also, uh, we have evidence of um, woodland management preserved on some of the timbers. 
and you can see you know places where side branches have been trimmed and with an axe and then healed over. And you basically it's deliberate woodland management. And we know this happens in later periods, but this is this is medieval and actually uh, firmly medieval. These timbers are growing for many years after they've been um, modified. Again, uh, this is uh, some of the, this is written about in uh, some of the IGNA articles. You can refer to those. All right, uh, another staff member who is here. Uh, this was an absolutely brilliant artifact that was found, and um, this was found. Uh, it must have been 06 or so, Angela. Are you? Yeah, what? around 06, I think. I about around 2006 or yeah. something like that. So basically, years after the excavation, we walked by this timber for years. It was just in a tank, and you know we had so many timbers to clean. It wasn't this timbers that this is the front part of the keel, and um, I remember you finding it and coming upstairs and telling us you thought you found a coin. And uh, we didn't believe you. You had to like haul us down the stairs to show us this. But it was uh, hidden in this little tiny uh, rebate here on the inboard face of the keel, where the stem starts over. That stem stem comes back to this point, and this is the inboard face. The stem starts over up, and uh, that coin, um, silver French coin, uh, had a cross on it. It was put in there for good luck, and it was only minted for a couple of months in 1447. So it shows you can still find things like this just years after the excavation, and you could basically walk in right by it and not even know it's there. So if you find a ship, look here. <laughs> because, uh, everyone looks in the mass step, right? Uh, a bit more about the small finds. A uh, handful of Portuguese coins found on board. Uh, so there's yeah Portuguese coins. I'll talk about the Portuguese ceramics. There seems to be strong uh, Portugal Portuguese connection in terms of the uh, small finds. And decidedly not British, you know, what's on board, especially when you look at the plant remains. And so, uh, during the uh, um, excavation of the ship, it was a rescue excavation, huge amounts of pressure to do all this work, and certain things had to be uh, given a secondary priority. Well, they did a great job in taking hundreds of samples of the muck between the interframe spaces, and they, you know, put it in buckets poured those into builders' bags, builders' ruffle sacks, you know, tied them up, labeled them up, and they sat on the shelf in our warehouse um, for at least eight years. And I finally got around after we'd you know, done most of the timbers, finally got around to opening these bags and started this big environmental archaeology project where we, where the material was uh, you know, standard environmental archaeology practice, you know, produced blocks of residues, and uh, it was amazing the material that was preserved in this mud. And it was very different, this kind of black, pretty, that uh, layer that was right against the inboard face of the outer hull planking down inside the interframe spaces versus all the alluvial clay that was on top of it. It was very clearly part of the use life of the ship as opposed to any post-deposition uh, contamination. So it was you know, sealed context of the use life. So it was saved, but it took us years to get around to doing it. And it was processed, and it was phenomenal what it contained in terms of insect remains, plant remains, you know, bits of ceramic, small, you know, the odd small find. But I, I think one, one of the great things, uh, what life, it tells you what life was like on board. There were thousands of flies, and just in simple, sam small-ish samples, there were uh, thousands of flies, uh, human fleas, dog fleas, uh, lice. I mean, it was, I think life was a bit challenging on board, uh, you know, down inside the vessel. And uh, other, you know, interesting beetles. It was just, I mean, the insect report is like 15 pages of, just pure information like this that was discovered in the preserved in the mud. Uh, huge amounts of fish bone, animal bone. Uh, I think there were 17 kinds of fish and shellfish found on board, including you know parts of cod that were about a meter long. Uh, probably as stockfish or saltfish on board, and then uh, all sorts of faunal remains. You name it, it seemed to be on there. You know, ducks, pigs, chickens, goats, cows. It was. It seemed to be just about everything. But you got a, a, crew, a ship like this has to have, you know, say, at least 30 sailors on board to handle the mainsail and um, or the yard, and you know maybe 40, and then 10 or 20 merchants or you know passengers. That actually takes a lot of food and a lot of um, you know water and supplies and all that. So that eats into your cargo uh, space. But what's um, well, there's a huge number of reports that have been done on this as well. If you want to, if you want to know more, but all this was. Uh, derived from this environmental processing, and you know they did find bones uh, during the excavation as well. Which were kept. But uh, if you look at the plant remains report, which is something like 26 pages long, uh, it's just filled with 
with interesting things. <laughs> interesting things, uh, nuts, uh, uh, grape pips, probably not grapes, probably raisins uh, or residue from wine. I should say it's tricky, it's, it's almost, I'd say it's impossible really to pick apart. You look at this in its totality and it's all these different foodstuffs. It, it's showing you the, say, 15 plus years of the vessel's life in one snapshot, so you can't really just make any finer than that, but also you, what you can't really necessarily discern is, is what the crew are eating, what the passengers are eating, and what the ship might have been carrying as cargo, or, or it could have been the same thing at the same time. So you have to take all that, you know, be careful with evidence like this, but it was there, it was found on board. And there was a huge range of, uh, like I said, 26 pages of, of interesting things on board, but, um, you know, things like flax and uh, uh, peas, uh, but interesting things like pomegranates on board as well. And uh, they found almonds, there were uh, uh, hops, I think there was um, uh, mustard as well. Just, you know, really interesting what was preserved in the mud. And, uh, uh, but I think really one of the most telling things that was found on board, it took a while, several years to actually crack what this was, but the ship, those bags of mud were filled with these little green leaves. Uh, they're really small, and uh, National Museum was working on it for a while in Wales, and they finally cracked it. It's uh, something called Western Prickly Juniper. Uh, it grows on the you know coastal Portugal, south, you know Algarve. And it's um, it's a relatively worthless plant. Nothing eats it. It's kind of like gorse or Scotch broom, uh, but the ship seems to be absolutely full of it, or at least the leaves um, from it. And uh, it was found, uh, there was heather in bloom and crowberries, which are, uh, they occur, exist in late summer down there. And when you tie all this together and you look at this plant, it looks, like, it appears that what they're doing is uh, this big ship, the big you know, Newport ship is down there in late summer being filled with this material as dunnage, as uh, a mattress or padding for the cargo, which would be casks of wine. I should say we found parts of over 100 casks on board, heads, hoops, staves. But nothing complete, just fragments here and there. Well, this was just kind of bycatch uh, with this, but uh, it, you know it's all in there, and it, it demonstrates seasonality. So it looks like the ship is, and this is uh, this is supported by the historical record where they talk about these big ships going down there late summer, waiting for the wine to be harvested, the grapes to be harvested, the wine to be produced, fermented, put in casks, and shipped up here as fast as possible because there's a an insatiable demand for it here, and b the um, <laughs> Uh, it doesn't keep, the wine doesn't last. It, it goes bad very quickly, so they have to get it up here and sell it, you know, shift it as quickly as possible. So it's just interesting, like, it seems to all fit together. And I should also say, really nothing is known about the Newport ship from the historical record, nothing concrete. Everything we've learned about it has been through archeological research, and uh, both in the, uh, during the excavation and during this, uh, what do you want to call it now, 14 years of uh, post-excavation work. I mentioned the ceramics uh, found on board. They say around uh, around 500 uh, shards of uh, ceramic. It's all Portuguese micaceous redware. Uh, it's being further analyzed now, but uh, it seems to be firmly from uh, Portugal. And it is um, interesting. A lot of it has soot staining on it, which has been interpreted as it's part of the uh, a. It's not um, none of it's the same. You know, it's not cereal uh, where It's just. Uh, all different odds and sods, pots, lids, jars, you name it, and uh, it's all obviously all broken, but also a lot of it has soot staining, which has been interpreted as being used by the crew on board the ship. Uh, fantastic collection of medieval rigging, and, uh, but again, what's interesting is what's not here, every you know 30 plus pieces of rigging, all of it you could lift with one hand. Well, the ship had bigger blocks, bigger pulleys, it had uh, you know lots of cordage, the sail, all of the yards, mast, all of it's missing. And so, but this stuff was found down in the mud. It just, they don't bother fishing around for it after it drops during the salvage work. But, you know, they salvaged everything else that was big and valuable and readily reusable. Uh, you know, fabulous, fabulous preservation of organics. You know, the timber was fabulously preserved. Therefore, you know, the rest of the organics were uh, in a fair state as well. Uh, textiles, uh, wooden combs. Uh, one of the wooden combs is great. It's got the double-sided, you know, fine teeth on one side for, um, or sorry, coarse teeth for straightening and fine teeth for getting the lice out. Uh, those were made of boxwood. There was a nice boxwood gaming piece. A uh, whole smattering of leather shoes uh, found on board and fragments of shoes. I, the, the leather collection is phenomenal and it's just hundreds and hundreds of pieces, but a lot of it just appears to be uh, 
some nice shoes, but a lot of it appears to be potentially tannery waste or just uh, contamination. It's hard to pick it apart. But if leather leather's your thing, you, we have a great report on this, and you can have at it. Uh, there were some interesting stone um, uh, five uh, uh, stone uh, shot found on board down inside uh, inside the vessel, and uh, uh, varied sizes from about 50 millimeters to 80 millimeters. So very small, you know, 50 mil. It's like a golf ball. To, uh, to like a cricket ball in size. These are all the spiked ships that are. Anyway, don't think broadsides and Mary Rose are, you know, a victory and all that. This is predates all that. These are simply, you know, would be fired from wrought iron breech loading guns, like deck mounted or rail mounted guns, simply as a, like anti personnel. And so, again, the guns would have been very valuable. They're not there. They would have been uh, salvaged and, and reused elsewhere. But the stone shot, it's, it's about as valuable as ballast, I think. And so it, it just uh, didn't bother picking that stuff out. Uh, one thing I really like on the ship is the pumps. There are bits and you know parts of pumps found all over the vessel, and including the you know, leather bird valve and foot valves, foot pump tube, just kind of scattered about, and some definite pump positions, and others that may be more or less on an ad hoc basis. What I think what we're seeing is um, at least when you look at the size of a lot of the components of the pumps is they're all exactly the same diameter. And I think there's this conscious standardization of um, these pump spares on board. And, it, you, you know, it's a, well, I'll show you one more slide, but, you know, I don't know if you know how these pumps work, but they're quite clever and uh, just hauled out, you know, board out tree trunk and they use this leather valve, or it, kind of like an umbrella. You push it down and it kind of collapses a bit and the water rushes past it. And then when you push down and when you pull up, the leather cone pulls out and seals against the inside of the tube, and that goes up and down, so that pulls the water column up. But then at the same time, this foot valve down here, uh, on the upstroke, it opens, letting water in. On the downstroke, it flaps down. And it's, it's, this contraption is only made out of wood, iron, and leather, but it you know, works brilliantly. And uh, this is, again, the pres level of preservation at the time is the amazing like wicker basket in the bottom of the pump, like a strum box, a filter. To, where the foot of the pump would have uh, been positioned. However, that uh, unfortunately that didn't uh, make it to conservation. It was just too fragile. But there's a you know decent in situ uh, documentation of that. Uh, one of my favorite artifacts is this archer's wrist guard. Uh, it's got Latin uh, uh, this script on it in Latin saying arm guard, <laughs> uh, bracer. Uh, but what I love about it is it's um, it's been used. It's been shot a bunch, and the string has hit, and it's been worn away. So it's somebody's, you know, personal item. Uh, yeah, things like this fragment of a stand up. I, I mentioned there are hundreds and hundreds of finds. I'm just glossing over some of the really, um, you know, interesting ones. There are many, many more, uh, including this uh, fragment of a an iron helmet with this uh, decorated decorative strip that was around it. Had a biblical verse. You know, uh, extremely not a typical helmet, uh, quite unusual, and uh, very interesting that, you know, what was left of it was found on board the medieval ship. And then, you know, nice things like, you know, the remains of a, of a knife from the mid-15th century, like a, just a standard, um, the bimetallic rivets, um, I think that's a box would handle. Just, you know, brilliant preservation of the organic side of it. So, that's a bit about the small finds. So, over the years, <laughs> we uh, transitioned from cleaning and then recording and after documentation and after wood science and photography, the timbers would be cleared for uh, conservation. And we uh, did the conservation, started the peg, we used peg and freeze drying. And that involved us um, uh, very manual. We fill the tank, uh, the empty tank up with peg and mix it. And then um, uh, we would uh, then pump that into a tank of timbers. And remember, we have 17 tanks. And, you know, it's like just a huge amount of to and froing of solutions and then increasing the uh, concentration of the peg. And over time, we, you know, uh, once they were sufficiently impregnated with peg, uh, you can see the peg, that was a Christmas, Christmas card one year, <laughs> matched a model on a pile of peg. And uh, we then loaded the, um, with, we had a big freeze dryer uh, located at the ship center, a uh, big one, and we would load that uh, sealed up and uh, push the button. And it would take two, three, four months, and then you'd open it up and you'd get uh, hundreds of dried, really well-preserved timbers. If you've been to the ships there, you've seen this. Uh, the problem is, we have thousands of timbers. And if you can get a few hundred in a load, and the load takes, you know, 
four or five months, it's, you can see the problem. It's, it takes years or even into the a decade or so. So uh, this is um, what it's like. This is just the last few years. This is where we you know, got to with the project. We would um, you know, load wet timbers. And eventually we had the freeze dryer. We went back to York, our local trust. Uh, we didn't have space for it in our new warehouse, so it went back to them. But we would transport two Arctic lorries would come down, and we would transport the so very unusual Arctic lorry loads going over the <laughs> uh, filled with peg treated but still wet, you know, pegged wood, and it would be shipped up there and put in the freeze dryer, and then every every subsequent year they'd come down with another couple Arctic lorries filled with dried but even ship. We'd unload those and we'd give them another you know, uh, couple of Arctic lorry loads, and we benefited hugely from. Um, all these students from Cardiff University to Conservation, Bournemouth, and um, uh, Lampeter, people, students would come and just get some real hands-on experience of what it was like to do this, you know, waterlogged woods conservation, and then probably swear never to do it again. <laughs> uh, but they, you know, we had some repeat uh, volunteers. So we, this is where we, you know, got to the last couple of years, uh, you know, just drying material off. But again, I mentioned it's a, kind of a mammoth task because there's so much of it. So once the material is dry, we have to. To uh, consider uh, its storage conditions, and so in this big warehouse we've got, uh, we'd previously been storing it in insulated shipping containers, but we were, you know, didn't have any more room for shipping containers, and you just couldn't put that much in a shipping container. But we took that kind of insulated shipping container concept big, and we built these big rooms out of um, scaffold, tube, uh, pallet wrapping, and kingspan foam, and I. I don't know if anyone from the council planning is here. But they may not be code, but they're really, um, they are uh, fit for purpose and we're really happy with, you know, how they maintain a really good condition in terms of temperature and relative humidity. And so they're kind of temporary stores, but, you know, they're rooms within rooms in our, in our warehouse right now. And we built them ourselves. And so we, uh, as you've seen if you've been to the ship center, so we, we take the hay, you know, freeze dried material, we, you know, track its location, wrap it up, put it on these shelves, and uh, that's where it currently sits. We have about, um, you know, it, it's a little bit of a nebulous, but say we have approximately 60, 70 percent of the timbers have been dried. So maybe one and a half thousand timbers are now dry and in storage, and there's arguably about a thousand timbers left. All the small finds, so a thousand timbers that have been pegged but are waiting for their go in the freeze dryer, and we have about a thousand artifacts and small finds and uh, uh, samples and whatnot that are also, there's basically, there's no more wet material at the ship center. Everything in there is conserved and um, we're just waiting for the rest to come back. And so that's where we're at in terms of conservation. Uh, it's just, it's gonna take a bit longer, but we're really happy with the results so far. So, uh, how much uh, Minus four minutes, but we're interested. Okay, <laughs> well, I'll uh, I mentioned about uh, the 3D modeling work we've done, and we are, you know, from, from excavation, 3D recording, 3D modeling, digital modeling, physical model, uh, all of this has been, is helping us um, with our ultimate goal, which is the reassembly of the medieval ship uh, when it's conserved, a reassembly and display in a suitable uh, museum. And so, uh, to this end, we've been doing things like uh, trialing, uh, taking dry timbers and lining them back up, you know, two adjacent timbers that were originally in the hole, seeing how they, how they fit back together. You can do this digitally, but then you really just want to make du doubly sure. And so we, because the timbers are shrinking, it's just distorting a bit during the um, conservation process, the freeze drying especially. And so we did some uh, trials where we would uh, start assembling the planks, adjacent planks, seeing how the framing might fit, and comparing that to what our you know, digital models would suggest. And we're very happy with that the ship will go back together, the planking anyway. The problem is the, uh, the framing shrinking a bit differently, so they're not going to fit perfectly like they did before. But we have uh, ways of uh, counteracting that. But you can see what's coming out of the freeze dryer. This is the, this is the end of the, this is dried, and it looks, it's amazing for medieval. It really looks, it's not black, it's not waxy. It, it looks more or less like oak. And so uh, what we're doing right now, working with Swansea University, uh, um, the last few years on the uh, engineering department, looking at building a very unique cradle to support the ship that would be completely hidden in the integrated spaces of the ship. It would be a comprehensive cradle to support the vessel, but the planking would hang from the outside of this kind of shell cradle concept 
and the framing would sit between it and the ceiling plates and stringers would cover it. And so you would basically walk into a museum and you would just see the ship. And so this is where we're, we're, all the feasibility work we've done so far says this is feasible. We're just, we're simultaneously working on trying to find a home for the ship in terms of a, a suitable display space, but we're also working on this cradle concept because all the other ships on display have issues with, big ships have issues with creep and distortion. And we know this will be a problem and so we want to avoid that by having a near, as near universal support as we can. Basically, you never be more than like four, uh, 50 mil from a, a support taking the weight of the timber. And so uh, models that we're following or not following include the, these. And uh, uh, really what we don't want to do is have to do what happened to Bremen Cog, which is this intervention where they've had to try to keep it from falling down. Like I said, all the major, you know, Boston Mary Rose, they, they're struggling right now. They are having challenges with creep and distortion. And so we're learning from them, we're working with them to try to make sure this doesn't happen with Newport. And one of our closest models would probably be Bell in Texas, uh, which has just gone on display in the last couple of years. Because uh, it's, uh, it's smaller, but some of the concepts they're using are, I think, are really sound, and um, we're in um, communication with them. So, in the big scheme of things, we are getting there. Uh, this is the ultimate goal: is to put the ship on display for the benefit of uh, you know, the, the people in the area, and uh, it should be a real tourist draw, a real economic impact for the city to have a basically international level uh, draw, which this ship can be. And um, just a very quick word about archiving and uh, publication. If you want to know more, I talk about all these different reports and drawings and all that. Uh, 20,000 files of this are free. They're online, posted by the Archaeology Data Service at York. And it's fairly comprehensive. All the data we've used to come to these conclusions and the conclusions themselves are largely in this ADS uh, database. And um, all the photos, site drawings, original timber records, it's all here, it's all free, and ID, uh, theoretically it's there in perpetuity. And so, uh, this is a great resource if you want to know more, especially, you know, I mentioned all those different specialist reports, if you want to know more about the insects, it's all here. If you, you can try that, or you can just Google ADS Newport ship, and you'll go right there. Uh, I mentioned the specialist reports, there's probably 40 different reports now that have been done. You want to know about it? It's probably up there, and some of these are exhaustive. Like the casks is like 800 pages. So just <laughs> knock yourself out. Uh, a couple of uh, IJN articles have been written about the project uh, three or four years ago, and uh, Miranda told me that they are now at least temporarily yeah, they're open access, open access. And they will be for, a while. for a while. So they are free right now. So if you want to know more, these are great places to start. It's full of definitive information and a huge amount of detail in the dendro chronological research that's been undertaken, but if you want a place to start, start with the, uh, the, the main Newport ship article. If you want to know more about the context of the ship, the environmental, sorry, the economic and political uh, maritime trade of the vessel, this book has just been published. It's the Proceedings of a Conference that was uh, held in Bristol a few years ago. Uh, it's all about the Newport ship and the role it would have played in the regional uh, local, regional, and wider European picture. And so it's not the full archaeological volume, but there's a paper by Nigel and I about the archaeology at the start of it. But it just attempts to put the ship in its context. So I see it as kind of a part B to the part A archaeological volume. And there's a, they're available upstairs, uh, friends of the ship. So with that, I'm sorry I went over, but uh, that's Newport ship in a nutshell. And I probably don't have time for questions, but I'll take them if they're if there is time, but otherwise just talk to, there's a few of us here uh, who are involved in the ship project, and we'd be happy to tell you as much as you want to know. <laughs>